Hi, and welcome back to Cultures of the Crisis, Corona and Beyond, the weekly lecture series presented to you by the chair group European Culture and Literature at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I'm Florian Lippert, and I'm joined today by my colleague Konstantin Miro, who will have a watchful eye on the chat. Thanks, Konstantin. Today we are addressing a crucial set of perspectives on cultural and social effects of the COVID-19 crisis, namely feminist perspectives, and I am delighted to introduce three colleagues of mine. Dr. Xenia Robbe, who is Assistant Professor of European Culture and Literature with a special focus on Russia. She holds degrees from the Universities of St. Petersburg and Gießen and was an Assistant Professor in African, Russian and Comparative Literature at Leiden University from 2012 to 2019 when she joined us in Groningen. She is the author of the book Conversations of Motherhood, South African Women's Writing Across Traditions and co-editor of the book Post-Soviet Nostalgia, Confronting the Empire's Legacies, which was published last year with Routledge. And she's also currently editing the volume Remembering Transitions, Local Revisions and Global Crossings in Culture and Media under contract with De Kreuter. Her ongoing research engage, engages with questions of time, memory and transitions in post-socialist and post-colonial cultures on a global scale. Our second speaker, Dr. Jeanette Tonder, is Senior Lecturer of European Culture and Literature with a focus on French and Francophone culture and literature. Her research interests include the topics of identity, autobiography and journey in space in the contemporary Francophone novel. Furthermore, Jeanette is particularly interested in migrant writing and the female voice and her current research project focuses on Iranian women's writing in Europe. And our third speaker is Dr. Esther Jiresch, who is also a senior lecturer in our chair group with a special focus on Sweden. She received her PhD here at the University of Groningen with a thesis on the role of networks in the work of female cultural transmitters of Scandinavian literature and culture in Europe around 1900, comparing the Dutch and Flemish and the Austrian slash German speaking regions. Esther's research interests include cultural transmission, gender studies and interdisciplinary research combining humanities and social sciences, particularly applied political science. So dear Xenia, dear Jeanette and Esther, thank you so much for being here today. And I hand over to you. Uh, hello everyone and thanks so much Florian for your very kind introduction and also for the opportunity to participate in this very topical uh, lecture series. Um, now, in our joint lecture, we'll reflect on the ways in which insights of feminist thought and practice can elucidate the inequalities of gender uh, in their intersection with race, class, um, and other axes of difference, and in which they can point at strategies of working against these inequalities. I will begin by focusing on questions of time. This will continue the earlier conversations in this series on our changing orientations during the COVID-19 crisis in terms of space, as reflected brilliantly by Christian Kirchmeier earlier, but also significantly and in interrelated ways in terms of time. While we were adapting to life in shrinking physical spaces, the alleged expansion of time was represented by the media as a compensation of sorts for the loss of mobility. I will approach this dominant construction of interconnected space and time as the corona chronotope and will reflect on it critically by asking how this hegemonic form obscures deep social inequalities and conflicts. Drawing on feminist theorizations of time, I consider how they can help us make sense of the conflicts that many have experienced in their daily lives during the crisis. The expectations of being productive and caring at the same time and in the same space of home, of being in fact even more productive than usually since we have more time, while being anxious about one's family, friends, the entire world, as well as one's employment, career perspectives and so on. 
conflicts between the desire and expectation to reconnect to your family and the simultaneously decreasing possibility to do so. All recognizable dilemmas, I argue, can be understood in terms of clashing temporalities. The clock time of modern economy with its emphasis on speed and flexibilization of labor and care time, which is often understood as process oriented, intersubjective and communal as an ideal type. I interest that. These temporalities, of course, do not exist on their own, but are intertwined within our life practices in multiple ways. After all, we'll see how care time is being commodified and transacted and how discourses of slow creativity, slow thinking and so on seem to transform the clock time practices of late modernity, but often in commercialized forms. During the current crisis, these transformations and their accompanying conflicts became particularly visible due to the concentration of contradictions within the shrinking physical spaces. The clash of temporalities, which reflected on is that symptomatic of larger processes rather than anything unique to this situation. Turning to um, feminist critiques of time, and I'm sorry the text is a bit, has a bit moved in this version, I wonder which pathways towards reclaiming time they can show beyond their ongoing commodification. I interpret reclamation as achieving greater ownership of time which we can understand together with Barbara Adam as a basic human right that could enable people to structure the temporal organization of their lives appropriate to context and conditions in accordance with their own and their dependents needs. Now to some uh, presentations. From the first days of the declared Corona crisis, we can recall how the media were flooded with expert advice on what we should do with the excessive time this is a free time that we all allegedly have now. The message was that now that we finally have time, we should use it efficiently and, for example, learn foreign languages, subscribe to a new app at reduced price, perfect our bodies, an online training course with a discount, here you are, or reconnect with our children. And here is a list of 100 free online sources for ideas of what you can do with your child. The enthusiasm with which many parents, and since I belong to this group, I could observe this process, in the first weeks of the lockdown responded to such messages, testified to the tenacity of these discourses and the firm presence of clock time with its pressures of productivity in family lives. These messages and the products they promote are part of the culture of self-improvement, popularized through self-help manuals, coaching programs, health apps, and so on, which targets and reproduces radically individualized self-perfecting subjects. The myth of increasing free time, which it promotes, is certainly new. It is related to the practice of decreasing official work hours since the 18th century, resulting in the growth of leisure time, which, however, exists only in, re in relation to work time, and thus is also subject to the laws of the clock. It has to be filled with activities which more often than not rely on consumption of something commercially produced by others. Such leisure time can often be not less tiring than work time, particularly when it meets with the pressures of care. So many individuals experienced huge exhaustion and feelings of disappointment after weeks of lockdown. What first seemed to be excessive time has turned into increased pressures of productivity due to the endless conference calls, additional projects, and new routines of self-improvement and so on. The idyllic expectation of gaining time through reducing movement turned into a sense of captivity, not just in space, but also in time. And this letter is actually often more lasting and harder to shake off uh, since new routines can extend beyond the lockdown period. Now, beyond the enthusiastic responses from the start, people were also resorting to dark humor. A series of popular memes focused on the impossibilities of the situation in terms of spending 24 seven with your family in a limited space with very limited time to attend to everyone's needs. Humor is of course a powerful way of expressing anxiety and pointing at a problem in an affective mode. Applying an analytical lens in turn, we see the clash of clock 
and care time, which is anyway a conflict in the lives of people with care responsibilities, but becomes hardly bearable under the lockdown conditions, where care can be shared outside of nuclear family and work pressures do not recede or even grow due to additional responsibility for dependent family members. For those in precarious jobs or informal employment, employment, often in care work or service sector, the necessity to work outside of home while putting their families at risk is the most radical case of such clash, which translates into complete erasure of family care time. What is experienced as a clash of temporalities is a result of the binary and hierarchical conceptions of work and life, production and reproduction, paid and unpaid work, characteristic of late modernity. Feminist scholarship has consistently attended to the interrelationship between gender hierarchies and hierarchies of time by identifying and critiquing practices of gender in time, clock time being historically connected to masculinity and care time rendered feminine. Second wave feminism focused on the difference of women's time in Yulia Christopher's gloss and its radical potentialities to subvert masculinist hegemony. The idea of women's time um, often understood as cyclical and task-oriented, um, produce important insights in fem feminist scholarship. Uh, but at the same time, the term involves the danger of reinstating gender dichotomies of masculine versus feminine. The concept of gender performativity offered a significant counterpoint, but post-structuralist feminism in general also somewhat neglected questions of time. The work of Barbara Adam in feminist sociology and Rita Felsky in feminist philosophy and cultural studies provide valuable insights that can be developed further for refining our understanding of time inequality and ways of confronting it. In terms of making sense of current tensions, Adam's focus on the hierarchies of time is crucial. While we've moved away from ideas of men's and women's time, it's important to acknowledge that some times and rhythms for example, of paid office work or big business are privileged, while, to quote Adam, any time that cannot be accorded a money value is consequently suspect and held in low esteem and constitutes what she calls shadow time. This structure of what Dana Luciana calls chronobiopolitics supports not only gender, but also other social hierarchies involving those outside of the time economy of formal and stable employment. Uh, so those unemployed or working in precarious jobs, the young and the elderly, people of color, non-nationals, and so on. Those critical engagements with time need to be intersectional and to involve practices of solidarity. Furthermore, we need to consider time beyond the binaries of work life. In Adam's words, we need to be sensitive to the complexity of everyday life, where the multiplicity of times forms an unproblematic cohesive unity and where the stresses and tensions between some of the less compatible times are managed and expressed. Moments of crisis such as the current one provide an opportunity to disentangle what is perceived as unproblematic cohesive unity and what is seen as ordinary and private. Such insignificant quote unquote details as deciding who makes meals when it's more than once a day, how children's homework is done when it's full-time schooling, or how to do work in between home chores or to organize family tasks around paid work, vice versa, when it's not just an occasional working from home day, magnify the issues which otherwise remain invisible even to those who are disadvantaged by the gender arrangements. To conclude, this routinized character of doing time makes it particularly difficult to begin questioning time practices and attempting to reclaim time. What may, however, make such pursuit possible are steps towards recognizing care as a public good and to recall Adam a human right, not only in terms of receiving care, but also in terms of giving care. This would accord more economic and social value to care, care work and would result in more equality of not only work or leisure, but lifetimes in general. Um, so this is it on my side and I'm passing the baton to Jeanette. Hello everyone. Um, I just uh, turned on the uh, camera briefly so that you can all see who is speaking. Welcome to the second part. Um, 
see if it works. Yes. Uh, welcome to the second part uh, where I will be discussing COVID-19 and female leadership. Now, I'll turn off the, the camera again and um, I hope you enjoy my presentation. Following uh, up on the conclusion of the first part, proposing to recognize care as a public good, it's essential to acknowledge that women comprise the majority of frontline healthcare workers globally. According to OECD statistics, almost 70% of health workers are women, meaning that female representation is vital in tackling the coronavirus crisis. Paradoxically, however, women are absent or underrepresented in expert groups advising governments during the coronavirus outbreak. To give you just one, but a telling example, in February, US Vice President Mike Pence posted an image, which you can see here on the right-hand side, showing the members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force on social media, which left many with one essential question, where are the women? Now, to increase women's participation and leadership in decision-making on COVID-19, it is clear that gender-responsive practices are needed. There is, however, a small group of women that has received a lot of media attention because of the effectiveness of the handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Seven women leaders in particular are often mentioned and set to manage the crisis better than many of their male counterparts. Now, these women leaders are generally praised for their empathic leadership, empathy being considered a typical female characteristic. This approach to female leadership as being empathic is met with some reluctance since it might result in a reappropriation of gendered binaries, demarcating sexual difference comparable to the danger of reinstating dichotomies regarding men's and women's time referred to in the first part of this lecture. Now, in this contribution, um, I will first discuss some examples of media representation in order to address the question of gendered stereotypes, which will secondly relate to academic scholarship on gendered binaries and leadership. And within this framework, I will then have a closer look at the performance of the women leaders during this coronavirus crisis in order to come back to the issue of gendered binaries and to challenge some assumptions and representation, representations regarding female leadership in the conclusion. Indeed, uh, in particular, the seven women leaders pictured on the left-hand side from northern European countries, New Zealand and Taiwan, are mentioned in the media. They are, however, not the only women leaders that have, have effectively dealt with the coronavirus crisis. Less visible in at least Western mainstream media, for example, uh, and uh, I mentioned first on top, top uh, right-hand um, Namibia's Prime Minister, Sara Kugongolwa Amadila, who subsidized masks for elderly and school children. To date, in Namibia, no one has died of the effects of COVID-19. Or, uh, on the bottom, Ethiopia's president, Zala Wagzoda, who called for global solidarity on her Facebook page. In Europe, little attention has been paid to Georgia's president, Salome Zurabichvili, which you can see on the top again, who has been at the forefront in mobilizing international efforts against the pandemic. And St. Martin's prime minister, on the, at the bottom, Silvia Jacobs, ordered travel restrictions early and postponed carnival on the Dutch Caribbean island. In this short presentation, I will not be able to discuss all of the women separately, but I think it is important to stress that not only in Western multi-party democracies with high levels of public trust in their governments, female leaders have been successful in handling the crisis. We also have to realize, though, that only 7% of the world's heads of state are female. They already had to overcome many obstacles to be in this position, could not have gotten where they are without certain leadership qualities that are now serving them well. Countries with um, the best response, um, lower death rates, better control of the spread of the virus, are countries with women leaders. In the media, articles, magazines, TV shows, journalists have focused on the personal and empathic qualities of female leadership, mentioning women's role as caregivers, stressing once again, as we saw in part one, women's care responsibilities. Women who, who work still often have the responsibility of care. In the articles discussing New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's performance, many references are made to motherhood and multitasking. 
She gave birth and offers in 2018. Norway's Anna Solberg is quoted many times because of a press conference for children also stressing parental qualities. Many articles reflect on the fact that they are also caregivers in their homes and families, thus creating a, an essentialist view of gender. When emphasizing typical fem feminine qualities, do these images contribute to a normalization of gender differences? Women leaders are doing well during the crisis because what they are doing, negotiating for the common good, is aligned with what women are supposed to do socially and what people expect from them. Their behavior is socially, socially accepted according to normative gender roles. Now, in current leadership studies, uh, there's also a strong trend to bring forward differences between the sexes in gender stereotypical ways. A salient idea is the existence of feminine leadership. Women leaders would particularly contribute to communication and cooperation, affiliation and attachment, intimacy and nurture. Women leaders thus have a transformational leadership style, as opposed to masculine hierarchical style. This distinction has, however, resulted in a tendency to essentialize gender. A variety of gendered binaries are at play when discussing feminine versus masculine leadership. This demonstrates, I think, that femininity is still constructed through the guise of hegemonic masculinity. In their book, The Female Vision, Helgeson and Johnson examine the outmoded dichotomy between big picture thinking on the one hand and care and maintenance of relationships on the other hand. Big picture thinking being related to toughness as an essential element of leadership and leadership seen as synonymous with vision. Care and maintenance of relationships considered a soft skill that is perceived as the work of women, which is often underassessed when it comes to vision. Halgerson and Johnson argue that as organizations grow more web-like, the capacity to integrate social skills into a larger vision offers women a way to move beyond these dichotomies. Pullen and Vakani focus on the notion of female masculinity as developed by Halberstam, precisely because it troubles the binary division between masculinity and femininity. Their goal is to explore difference itself, reading masculinity outside the male body. Female masculinity highlights the performative aspects of gender, and these scholars seek to redefine feminine leadership by taking it out of the masculine domain of corporate leadership. When we look at it from this perspective, as Du Billing and Alveson argue, the idea of feminine leadership certainly has advantages. It contributes to demasculinization of leadership, and this means dis disconnecting it from its masculine tradition. It might also be more pro profitable, however, to use other critical vocabularies than feminine leadership. And here we could turn to forms of feminist leadership, recognizing the intersections of gender inequality and all other forms of social and political oppressions, or inclusive forms of leadership, drawing, for example, on the work of black feminist Patricia Hill Collins. Within this framework of normalization of gender differences in the media, the scholarly discussion of moving away from conventional ideas on leadership, often based on gendered binaries, I will now turn to the question of how the women leaders performed during the COVID-19 crisis. Which decisions did they take? How can that actions be ca characterized. When looking at the spread of the disease, three factors emerge as having a significant impact on it. Population density, exposure to who traveled, and the date when cultural institutions, schools, catering industry, factories were shut down. The first one cannot really be influenced by a leader, but the travel restrictions and the shutdown are directly related to actions taken by leaders. These women, leaders, indeed, all acted quickly. They didn't underestimate the situation, responded quickly, decisively. Lockdowns were imposed, all non-necessary travel was banned. They cultivated a diverse set of expert advisors, a wide network to help them succeed, demonstrating their capacity to listen to others, to acknowledge the importance of group performance. Their decisions were data-driven, understanding the essential need for widespread coronavirus testing and sometimes offering free testing to citizens. Strict restrictions were imposed with regard to social distancing, asking sacrifices, while at the same time reaching out to citizens via social media. They called upon everyone for shared responsibility and global solidarity, setting themselves as an example. Now, instead of framing this within the discourse of the feminine masculine dichotomy, as many professionals have done, I propose to relate their performance to capacities such as strength and decisiveness, as well as being capable 
capable of displaying feeling. They disclose a diverse repertoire of leadership strategies, which have inspired them to make effective decisions in collaboration with others and by communicating with their citizens. To conclude, starting from the need to increase women's participation and leadership in decision-making on COVID-19, I have focused on the media representation of a small group of women leaders put forward as being very effective in handling the situation by discussing some examples of gendered stereotypes presented in the media, relating them to the binary division of masculinity and femininity in which many scholarly discussions of female leadership are based, I've tried to demonstrate the need for a different perspective, transgressing the outdated, outdated dichotomies, disconnecting leadership from its masculine tradition. And my conclusion is that the performances of these women leaders disrupt normative accounts challenge assumptions and representations of female leadership and their effective and well-rounded leadership sets an example for a new type of leadership that the 21st century needs, enabling women not only to be at the forefront of care, but also of decision making. Thank you for listening. Here are my sources and I am very happy to um, give the floor to Esther Yerish, who will present the final part of this lecture. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Shanet. I hope the audio is working well now. And I'm also trying the slides. Uh, yes, it works well. So uh, welcome to the third part of this lecture called Feminism, Culture and Politics. I will now also turn on my camera so you can see it on the slides. I would like to start with a quote by Khalil Gibran Muhammad, a professor for history, race and public policy at Harvard, who only recently participated in an online lecture called Health Inequity and COVID-19, where he highlighted the effects of the coronavirus in healthcare inequalities, marginal groups, in particular people of color, face in the US. Starting with an historical account of these inequalities, Mohammed stated, Corona yeah, brings uh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Esther, to interrupt. It seems the yeah. audio is a bit shaky. So I think this is an issue of uh, the distance that you have to your microphone. If you can use the microphone in a, in a fixed spot, because usually it's good, but sometimes it's, it, it gets a lot. Uh, yeah, is, uh, is it better now? Like now it's perfect. Yeah, this is perfect. Yes, sorry okay. for the interruption. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. OK, um, I will continue with the uh, Professor Mohammed's quote, um, he said, Corona brings the past into the present. Um, Mohammed propagates the use of the knowledge of the past to build a better future. Both his observation and the intention for the future are very much applicable to the issue of feminism and Corona. Bringing feminist uh, issues and strategies to achieve equality from the past into the present through the vehicle of art is what I will discuss today. I will present two examples of cultural practices that are strongly linked to politics and deal with the negative and positive sides of successful feminism and feminist leadership in a powerful way. After that, I will present one more example, which can also be linked to feminism and to Corona crisis in particular. My approach is situated within a general research framework, and here I would like to qu quote my colleagues James, Judith and Pablo's first presentation of our series, a framework uh, that focuses on how culture can function as a political tool as well as a potential for social change. I will highlight my case studies relevance for furthering feminism. This is where I would like to make the link to female and feminist leadership that Jeanette was talking about. Let me start out with presenting to you a forgotten, however rediscovered, Austrian politician whose endeavors were paramount for the advancement of feminism and equality in Austria in the mid and late 19th century, and whose legacy has only recently inspired fascinating works of art. Meet Johanna Donal, who became first Secretary of State for General Women's Questions in 1979 and first Women's Minister uh, in 1991. She was also one of the first outspoken feminist politicians in European Parliament. 
Raised by her grandmother, a child out of wedlock to a working class mother, Donald became a social democrat to the core, already joining the party as an adolescent. Later, she found a major supporter in the famous social democratic chancellor Bruno Kreisky, a well-known feminist and women's endorser. Donald's political agenda comprised women's right to abortion, shelters uh, for battered women and children, more power for women, sexual education in schools, etc. Always direct and straightforward uh, were her statements, uh, as for instance, the vision of feminism is not a female future, it's a humane future. Countering criticism for being too demanding and loud, she would uh, reply, being silent for tactical reasons has always been proven a mistake. As for the feminist political achievements, Donald was a significant driving force behind. I would like to mention only a few. 1973, women's right to abortion. 1974, raising of birth allowance and maternity allowance. 1978, the opening of the first women's shelter in Vienna. 1989, the reformation of sexual criminal law, where marital rape was finally equally penalized as regular rape. Well, the list does go on. Even the donor often had the support of her party, and or independent women's organizations, she was a leader in bringing in new motions and propagating change in legislation. Her leadership style discloses strength and decisiveness, as well as care and solidarity to all women. So she does fit well into the group of female leaders Jeanette discussed, who challenge normative representations of female leadership. Unfortunately, this challenge was too much for Donald's contemporary male colleagues. At the height of her career, in spring 95, Donald was abruptly and unexpectedly discharged from her position only a few months prior to her planned res resignation. In a government reshuffle of young conservative Prime Minister Franz Franitsky, she was simply in the way, not being able to finish several women's projects dear to her heart and leaving on her own terms hit Donald understandably very hard. However, this disregard for her accomplishments, as well as her person, was not the worst thing that happened to her. The biggest injustice, in my opinion, was that her legacy and herself were cast into oblivion through this action. And this is where art comes in and resurrects the memory. In summer 2011, artist Isabella Kresse started the project uh, Birken für Johanna, Birch Trees for Johanna. In all of Vienna's 23 districts, Kresse planted a birch tree in a public park, complemented by a concrete sign bearing the inscription Für Johanna Donald. Not only does this project function as a homage to the politician, it also engages with the predominantly male presence in public spaces, first and foremost carrying the names of great founding fathers. I would like to quote Kresse about her project idea. Like the birch tree, an especially robust pioneer plant that manages to grow in new unsettled habitats, Johanna Donnell has penetrated the political wasteland and proven resilient. Now, what I like so much about this project is that Kresse not only figuratively makes room for Donald's memory, but also literally conquers the public space in her name, which she was so abruptly thrown out of. Another great artistic tribute to Donald's life and work is Upper Austrian filmmaker Susanne Derflinger's documentary movie, Johanna Donald, Visionary of Feminism, that started screening only this January. Derflinger, an ardent feminist herself, proved almost visionary qualities with this movie when it appeared right before the crisis, showcasing all forgotten feminist issues that still prevail in Austrian society, which are very much applicable to general Western society, and only became more visible with the impact of the coronavirus. Derflinger aspired to make a film against forgetting and for a future of equality, a film that offers a role.
for today's and the coming generations. As several political uh, scientists and commentators have observed, has the conservative political turn since 2000 with the government coalition of the Conservative People's Party ÖVP and the right-wing populist party FPÖ caused a serious setback for women's politics in Austria. Amongst others, abolishing the women's ministry and subsuming women's questions into a general family framework has significantly worked towards repositioning women in society according to a traditional patriarchal view. Clearly, Derflinger's work is a celebration of the politician's life, work, and the feminist statement. We do not see any negative aspects of Donald besides her excessive smoking. Even though Donald describes herself as being annoying, she never once loses her temper or resorts to unfair attacks during heating, heated discussions shown in the film. The film clearly depicts the struggle Donald and her supporters had to fight against the defenders of patriarchal structures in order to make the much needed changes in legislation and society, I mentioned before. An absolutely essential uh, struggle, as Donald stated it herself, women have always only ever received what they have fought for themselves. My last case study leads us away from politics per se, but still contains feminist issues and is greatly applicable to the situation Corona has led us in. Fellow Austrian author Marlene Haushofer's novel, Divan the Wall, originally from 1963, was adapted in film, adapted to film in 2012 and rediscovered by a French audience in 2019. The story, an excellent reading for this particular time in a nutshell. Uh, the unnamed female protagonist travels with two friends and their dog to a hunting lodge in the Austrian Alps. The next morning, the woman discovers that her friends have disappeared and only the dog remains with her. Trying to find her friends to set off, she sets off to walk to the village, accompanied by the dog. In the middle of the road, the journey comes to an abrupt halt when they run into an invisible wall that separates them from the rest of the world. In the distance, the woman can see villages, but they are seemingly frozen in time. Does this seem familiar? After several attempts to escape, she finally resigns to her life in isolation with the dog and several other animals she takes responsibility for. She takes on the hard work of a peasant and hunter to ensure her own and uh, her animal survival. The story oscillates uh, between haunting descriptions of loneliness, despair, mental and physical exhaustion, and wonderful moments and after many months, the woman experiences a peaceful summer with her animals. When the clock in her head finally has been stopped, she delves into a state of, in modern words, mindfulness and inner peace. This peaceful female universe of being in harmony with nature is violently disrupted a year later. Completely out of the blue, another survivor, male, appears only to brutally slaughter her beloved animals. Even if this scene only constitutes a small piece of the novel and film, it is a key scene. In the feminist reading of uh, Maria Regina Kech, um, she suggests uh, to focus on Haushofer's gender perspective of the roles of victim, perpetrator and bystander, as played out in the seemingly apolitical microcosm of the family. The raging man could be interpreted in the framework of domestic violence increasing under isolated cohabitation circumstances. When he suddenly, without any reason, starts slaughtering her animals, the protagonist takes matters in her own hands, reversing traditional victim-perpetrator roles and making short work of the intruder, shooting him to death. The representative of a suppressing patriarchy is annihilated, by this strong woman fighting back to protect her so carefully cultivated space. After a hard period of mourning her animals, the novel has an open end, however with a positive note. The woman's cow is 
is expecting a calf and the protagonist is optimistic towards the future. Here I will end my account of women who in real uh, life and art fight, raise their voice and take space in order to provoke political and societal change. My task as a researcher I see in amplifying their voices, starting discussions about solutions and taking part in the struggle for equality. In the words of the great uh, Johanna Donnell, I will promise you we will continue to be annoying. These are my sources and I do have one final remark on behalf of all three of us. One important remark. We all talked about feminist issues mainly focusing on white Western middle class women because this is who we are and this is our expertise. We are aware of our privilege. However, this is a starting point and could inspire much needed research into intersectionality, especially in these times of heightened awareness of structural racism in our society. So it is imperative that more research will be done to investigate the old and new challenges of women of color, disabled and LBGTQ people, making their voices heard and giving them room. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Esther, and thank you, Senia and Jeanette, for uh, these, well, three perspectives with multiple intersections, multiple interconnections between each other, and a lot of potential for questions and discussions, I'm sure. So everyone in the audience, as always, you're very welcome to ask questions and make comments using the chat function for this please go in the lower right corner of your computer window, click on the two white arrows on pink ground, then click on the speech bubble, and then in the lower right corner, you can ask a question by writing into the chat box and then send it off. Uh, and I will uh, select and, and read out your questions to and comments to the speakers. So the chat is open as of now. Uh, and while everyone is typing, I, as always, take the privilege uh, to ask the very first question to our very first speaker, namely to Xenia. So thank you again, Xenia, for, uh, for this great and, and very deep account of time within the context we're discussing uh, today. Uh, I, I was really intrigued by, um, by your discussion of this, of this marketing mantra that indeed is kind of omnipresent, it seems, from day one. So you wonder whether whether some firms actually are prepared for this scenario. So this mantra that goes, now that we finally have time, why don't we consume mm -hmm. even more than before, right? Which is obviously nothing but cynical for so many people. And this is actually also what my question is heading at. The, the, the high number of people who actually have less time than before, for instance, because they're carers for, for families and have to work. Uh, you, uh, Xenia, have also already published an article on this on this very matter, actually. So I was wondering in regards to numbers, this to me, this seems without having any proper data, however, uh, to me, this seems one of those cases when studying intersectionality, intersectional topics, in which the minority actually seems to be a silent majority, namely those people who actually have less time than before and who need to reconsider and rearrange uh, their, their so-called work-life balance and so on and so forth. Uh, so I was wondering, Xenia, do you happen to have any knowledge about, about the actual numbers there to kind of confirm or not, not confirm this impression that I get that actually in regards to overall time management, which was at the center of your presentation, um, well, <laughs> there are more problems than before, so to speak. Or how would, how would you evaluate this, this question of, I mean, how many, obviously by, by the care problems, so many people are affected clearly. So I, I do wonder uh, whether, in this case, also, the, the there might actually be a majority carrying these problems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Florian, for your very thoughtful engagement uh, with things that, about which I was talking. Um, I haven't investigated this problem in terms of numbers, and that would be, in fact, a, a, a subject for a sociological study or series of studies. So, um, what? But at the same time. I think the first impression 
um, that the the people who have less time than before are the minority. I think this first impression is not completely justified uh, because I propose to think about this in intersectional ways and about many different ways and access of uh, advantages and disadvantages, uh, oppression and, and, and uh, um, uh, benefiting from the situation. Uh, and so if we think about it in an sec intersectional way, um, so on the one hand, we have middle class people who are uh, relatively easy, and I'm, I'm stressing relatively, so it's at, at the first glance, relatively easily uh, could transition to working online. Um, but there are also people uh, who had to work outside of home and particularly uh, taking care of those middle class people in terms of delivering goods and uh, keeping on all the services so that this minority of people could work from home. So if, if we see these two types of work and types of uh, managing time as interconnected, we'll see on the one hand, uh, inequalities. On the other hand, uh, joint, probably joint um, dispossession of time, although in different ways. So it's a, a very complex matter, um, I think. Uh, so how, how these dispossessions and possessions of time, ownership of time are measured, um, has to be uh, considered in each individual situation. But I think there are more intersections of different social status, uh, social class, than in terms of uh, lacking time in this situation, than we could think. So what, what, what I propose, uh, and not, not just me, but I, I, I uh, take the inspiration from uh, a lot of uh, feminist scholars in particular, um, the, the, the idea of uh, taking care work as public good. Um, this is something from which people of different social groups could benefit dramatically. So both those people who um, have been working uh, digitally, online from home and taking care of their children. So if care is recognized as a public good, then um, we would see, it would become visible that these people were doing double work. So they had still the same time, but uh, perform something that is usually, um, uh, or at least half of this, half of this work is usually performed by other people. Um, but at the same time, we could also see how people of more marginalized social groups were doing exactly the same, but with greater risks. In terms of time, they they were also uh, dispossessed, but also with a greater risk to their health. I'm, I'm afraid that's a long answer to uh, to your question, but the, these are my thoughts so far. Great. Thank you so much. So I was just signaled that there might be a technical issue with the chat function, which I did activate uh, at the beginning of of the of the Q and A section. So might be that our beloved platform collaborate uh, plays as a trick. Ah, there you go. Here come the first comments. So the comment function does mm -hmm. work. Uh, thank you for uh, for confirming there. Um, so as long as people are still thinking about their questions, uh, thank you, Xenia. Yeah, that was a long answer, but a very, very substantial one. I think indeed, I mean, the, the number crunching is only one side of things, obviously, right? So the, uh, my question was rather aiming in that direction, which you so very kindly answered now, actually, to uh, like, so, so what are the general, what are, what are the general problems behind these, um, behind these, uh, yeah, what I call marketing mantra, behind these very weird assumptions about how everyone's average life is supposed to look, whereas actually it's, it's really quite different, as you made very clear. Great. So um, here uh, comes a question for uh, Jeanette, uh, or the question, the comment actually starts. Uh, Dear Xenia, Jeanette and Esther, many thanks for this insightful presentation. Could you, dear Jeanette, comment on the gendered constructions of empathy? Jeanette, that's one for you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question, Constantine. Um, yeah, it's interesting because, of course, empathy is also 
uh, a characteristic or, or an aspect that we discuss a lot in our in our courses as well related to uh, literary studies, uh, literary theory, um, empathy also related to, to reading, uh, reading for example. I thought it was quite interesting to compare that with the way in which um, the, um, the notion of empathy is used in, in a lot of leadership uh, studies, scholarly studies on, on leadership. In, in, and I showed you some, uh, some covers as well of, of books that, that really promote at the moment or since a while uh, empathy as being a very important element of, of leadership and one of the leadership qualities actually that, that is, is really needed. So um, what I think is, is important is to take that, that notion of empathy now out indeed of these gendered constructions that you still see a lot, at least in the articles and the books that I, that I read uh, so far, um, as being a typical uh, characteristic of female leadership, which then, uh, you know, uh, promoters say also should be adopted by male leaders. Uh, but this still keeps the empathy within the gendered construction. So also here, uh, as I suggested at the end of, of, of my talk, I think empathy is um, can work really as a um, uh, as as a characteristic and as a, an important feature for leadership, but taking it out of the gendered uh, uh, discourse uh, and and making it a, a leadership uh, quality that um, that is part of the leadership, the twenty first century leadership that we now need. I hope that this is kind of an answer to to your question, Constantine. I do very much think it is. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. And here comes the next question for you from the audience, uh, which goes as follows. Thank you all for these very interesting presentations. You gave us a lot to think about. I have a question for Jeanette. Is the fact that the media seem to be surprised that female <laughs> leaders have done well not also telling? Is it caused by the leadership qualities that they and many others overlook? Thank you, Saskia. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, of course. Um, it, it was quite surprising to all of a sudden see that many articles and, uh, uh, you know, mag magazines also talking about uh, women leaders, uh, indeed showing, demonstrating that um, this seemed to be something quite new, yes, as if, uh, as if female leaders had been invisible so far, which I think uh, uh, for a large, in a large sense is indeed, uh, is indeed true. This is telling that all of a sudden these uh, seven women leaders are, are, are represented as, you know, doing something different or new, um, whereas uh, indeed um, and in different parts of society, uh, female leaders have been working, uh, you know, in in this way for 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 quite quite some time already. Um, uh, so I hope, actually, you know, on the positive note, um, my idea would be that this is a kind of trigger um, to not only look, you know, at this high political level of, you know, uh, leadership uh, in, in in government as prime ministers and presidents, but now start looking also in all other sections of of society, um, different. Um, domains um, you know we could look at university as well that might be a, a, an interesting case to to look at um, uh, you know what qualities uh, are present and and how could they be stressed more uh, and linked more um, to the leadership that we are needing now in, in in our modern time so yeah thank you Saskia for, for your question absolutely I'm, I ex absolutely agree with you uh, if I may connect to that, Jeanette, because I was uh, when you when you made so to speak the the connections between different forms and kinds of leadership uh, ships, I was reminded of the ongoing discussions in many parts of the world uh, about about quota, right? Participation mm -hmm. quota. So should there be a fixed quota in depending on the area? I mean, I'm a bit more familiar with the German context, for instance, where uh, for many many years now there have been discussions about whether there should be a fixed female quota in boards of the biggest firms of the biggest enterprises it's probably hard to generalize but i was wondering do you have any any views on quota politics per se in these contexts or on quota or positive or negative examples uh, if if existent of of a quota solutions in particular cases such as the ones you have discussed 
Mm -mm. Yeah, thank you for the question. I haven't I haven't looked into it in detail, but I have read read, read some articles about it. And you know, if I can can refer to the example of the University of Eindhoven, of course. Also, another thing, something that is related to Saskia's question, it was also quite telling uh, that so many reactions came when the University of Eindhoven decided to have this uh, this quota. Uh, because, you know, they argued this is really the only way to change the situation. Uh, we really need to, to do this. And there were lots of reactions, uh, you know, uh, men and women saying, uh, of course, this is not just and then women will only be selected because of the fact that they are women. Um, and, and then all, all the uh, people in charge in, at Eindhoven University said, well, rest assured, we will definitely still select the most, um, you know, excellent people. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure, you know, I, I should look into it more. You're also comparing countries, as, as you say. It, it, I'm not sure how it works in, in different countries in, in Europe, for example. Uh, but this is up for debate. And some articles I read really stress the fact that this is the, actually the only way uh, we can see the, oh, that's another example, the parity, uh, parité in, in Canada as well, with uh, Trudeau's government saying, you know, we absolutely need 50-50 representation in the government. Um, this is does reflect, you know, also a cultural change and, and a way of thinking. So my guess would be that that in imposing these quota will uh, will change uh, views and also selection criteria and selection groups and these kind of things. But it's something that we'll, I will have to look into further to really be sure about. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, and well, thanks to you. Here uh, comes another question from the audience, uh, this time to Esther. Uh, so the question goes, thank you all for an insightful presentation. I have a question for Esther. You focused a lot on art from the past decade, and I was wondering whether there had been any increase in feminist-oriented artwork during the period of lockdown. Of course, the cultural sphere is under more of a threat than ever, and it would be interesting to know whether this has meant that artists have, in effect, been significant, sorry, significantly cut off from important sources, for instance, funding and public interest. Esther, this one's for you. Yeah, can you hear me? Thank you very much uh, for yes, this it interesting. Works. Does it work? Can you hear me? Yes, it works. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, interesting question. Um, I, I have to admit that I just started uh, this kind of, of research project, so I'm a bit uh, um, in the beginning. So I don't know about an increase uh, in feminist oriented artwork. I did, though, uh, observe, maybe as, as others also observed in, in the Austrian and also in Swedish newspapers, an increase on uh, the feminist crisis uh, by Corona and uh, culture wise. Um, there was um, a bit of a scandal in Austria where the former Minister of Culture, um, uh, Ulrike Lunacek, was recently um, uh, dismissed, um, yeah, or dismissed, yeah, or she uh, um, went uh, voluntarily uh, because she had gotten a lot of um, criticism by different uh, artists, many, many groups of artists even, uh, that she did not uh, push. Um, um, uh, subsidiary help for artists under lockdown. So this this is as far as uh, what I know what happened in, in the Austrian cultural sphere. But um, I will definitely look more into this uh, um, uh, idea and question. It would be uh, very interesting to see. Thank you very much. I hope, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't really answer this question. Well, uh, thanks to you, Esther. If I, if I might uh, connect to that and also think of that brilliant cultural example that Xenia had in the beginning in her presentation, which I think you didn't really comment on Xenia, but I loved it. So there was a picture of Stephen King's Shining and the question like what bad things can happen <laughs> during lockdown, yeah. uh, which made me think and also your your um, final uh, example, Esther, about, about Household as the Wall, right, with this uh, rather rather violent uh, turn of uh, turn of things about the precise relationship that you is to see between cultural artifacts cultural works like like films novels etc uh, and um, yeah and, and changing people's minds ultimately right so the the notion of empathy was discussed uh, earlier already um, with with Jeanette a bit so would you is to see cultural artifacts which is a rather common argument 
as such as novels or films as primary carriers of empathy so is this like in the in the case of the walls so we do not assume this is kind of a standard hyper realist typical assumption of what people should do so to speak but rather rather obviously a transferable or possibly a transferable model of how people should uh, start rethink certain given realities engage with so-called possible worlds and possibly also gain a different sense of empathy possibly so would, would that be kind of a prime connection between between the the cultural works and and the real life so to speak or do you see any other any other strong connectors there Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Florian. I think um, uh, empathy is a very, very important in, in culture and, and works of art. And um, I try to remember who said this, one of my colleagues, I was either, I think, Pablo or Vera in our um, introduction series uh, for, for students reading modern Europe, uh, that, or even maybe constantly, maybe <laughs> here, um, and, and they said, um, even though things are not real that are happening movies, in films, our feelings uh, that get triggered are real. So um, I think um, art can uh, be very important to moving people and changing their minds. And as far as, as Donal uh, goes, who was also buried in my mind very, very deeply. So since I've seen the movie, I have at least spoken to uh, 20 people about it and and uh, getting the word out and to watch this movie and uh, to bring it into connection with all the ongoing media discussion. And, um, um, oh, thank you, Constantine. Maybe it was, then I heard it maybe from, from you. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is very important to, to think about and, and, and there's an underestimated um, potential for, for also social change. Of course, it, it could go very slowly, but I think the important thing is also mentioned, uh, we have to keep on talking about these issues and uh, bringing up the discussions. Um, and uh, yeah, indeed, uh, yeah. I think I think it's uh, empathy, and and uh, well, uh, empathy can be transmitted by art very very well. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Or did I, you I, want I, me? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, please go on. Sorry for, yeah. for interrupting. Um, no, I didn't really. Uh, did you also want me to comment on on the wall, or is this uh, answering your question a bit already? No, I was actually really thinking about say say more more general connections. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much uh, for those who uh, cannot see the chat because they're watching the recording. So uh, what uh, Esther was referring to and what Constantine kind of delivered was a um, the title of the respective work by Suzanne Keen. The book is entitled Empathy and the Novel. So this is where this this thought of uh, emotions being real uh, when when consuming. Um, uh, cultural artifacts uh, stems from. Thank you also, Constantine. Okay, here is another question that goes, thank you, Esther, Jeanette, and Xenia for three wonderful lectures about important topics. Esther, did Johanna Donal discuss LGBT plus issues? Thank you very much, Petra. It's a great question and a very interesting fact I didn't have time to mention. Johanna Donal herself was gay um, after after like she had a traditional marriage and two kids. Um, uh, she she found her life partner who also appeared in the movie as yeah, her widow. They even were married, and um, so her, her widow stated a lot of things that uh, Donal didn't want to make this an official topic. Um, so she didn't live uh, openly gay. And as far as I know, uh, the research I did, I didn't find any um, discussions that she started. One thing that might be related that she was also very um, um, uh, a driving force behind um, uh, a law that was passed, I think, in the, 80, in the late 80s, of single mothers uh, being the sole, the guardian of their children, because before the authorities were always the guardian of um, single mothers and this is um, um, could of course also uh, impacted uh, many lesbian uh, mothers um, I would suppose but more than that I'm, I'm afraid I don't know I hope this uh, answers your question a bit <laughs> okay thank you Esther um, 
I don't see any further questions right now in the chat and looking at the time. I think we're well in time, especially given the fact that we had uh, three speakers today. So I would like to say a very big thank you once more to Xenia, Esther and Jeanette for uh, joining us here today. And also a big thank you to the members of the audience who asked questions and uh, made uh, comments. Uh, this was a very rich and very deep session on very urgent perspectives, obviously. Um, I would like to close today's session with uh, two short remarks. First, next week, please join us for Juan del Valle's presentation, which will take place at three o'clock in the European time uh, afternoon. And as always, in case you have missed anything, any of the previous lectures to which are today's lectures uh, kindly referred several times, uh, you can watch all the recordings of the previous lecture and also of this lecture in case you want to rewatch it uh, on our website. Uh, if you're not familiar with the website, that's the page you have logged in through, uh, or most of you will have. Uh, then you can simply Google Cultures of the Crisis Groningen. And last but not least, one uh, more thank you to Konstantin, who took care of chat management today. So, guys, uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Thanks once more to Xenia, Jeanette, and Esther. That was that was a fantastic session today, and uh, yeah, hope to see and read and hear you guys very soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Florian, and everyone who is listening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.